Good day, students, and welcome to part one of the Integrated Algebra Regents exam for January 2014. In this installment, we are going to be going over um, problems one through five. You can find the collection of other clips at mapbooks.com slash test prep. All right, let's take a look at uh, question number one. It says, an example of an equation is, now to answer this question, we have to take a close look at what an equation is. An equation, this is a keyword here, is basically a mathematical statement with an equality sign in it. So whichever option has the equal sign, that makes it the statement an equation, okay? So which of them have a statement that two quantities are the same? This is just one quantity, this is a um, quadratic trinomial. Uh, this is an absolute value quantity. This is a factored uh, um, quadratic quantity, but this right here is an equation, is a quadratic equation because you have that equal sign there, okay? So our answer is going to be option number four. All right, let's shift our attention to problem two. We have to find the greatest common factor from these uh, two terms here. So our greatest common factor is basically the biggest factor we can extract from these two uh, terms, okay? So the first thing we're going to do is uh, to make the process easy is to decompose these two into their, um, into their prime factors, okay? So for 3m squared, 3m squared, 3 is a prime number, so it cannot be de decomposed. So 3m squared, let me just write it out first. 3m squared times n, I'm going to write it as 3 times m times m times n. And then for 12m n squared, 12 can be broken down, right? You can use your factor tree to break down 12. Take out a 2 from 12, you're left with 6. Take out a 2 from 6, you're left with 3. So 12, the prime factor of decomposition of 12 is 2 times 2 times 3. So 12 m, m n squared can be written as 2 times 2 times 3 times m times n times n. Okay? So this is the prime factor decomposition of these two terms. Okay? So let's write them in a horizontal orientation. So we have 3 times m times m times n, that's for 3m n squared, plus 2 times 2 times 3 times m times n times n, as a decomposition of 12m n squared. Now, greatest common factor is the greatest uh, term we can that is common to these two uh, terms right here, okay? So let's see what's common. We know that 3 and 3 are common, so we can factor that out. What else is common? We have one M here, one M there, that's common. We have an, another M here, but we do not have another M there, so it's only one M that's common to both sides. How about Ns? We have one N here, and we have another N here, so one N is common to both sides. So if we want to factor out the greatest common factor, we weren't asked to do it, but let me just show you, it's going to be 3MN. Okay, 3mn will be the greatest common factor that we factored out, and we'll be left with, um, let me identify what we're left with, this m, uh, this two twos, and this n, okay? So we had only one m on the left, we have an extra m left here, so we have an m plus, two times two is four, and then the last n, okay? So this is the greatest common factor, the GCF. Um, and our answer is going to be option number three. All right, let's shift our attention to problem uh, number three. It says, let's read it. It says, Jeremy is hosting a Halloween party for 80 children. He will give each child at least, at least one candy bar. If each bag of candy contains 18 candy bars, which inequality can be used to determine how many bags C Jeremy will need to buy? So when finding or we're writing an inequality for the um, number of bags um, Jeremy will need to buy. 
All right, so to start this off, we're gonna write down an equation that guarantees that every child gets at least one bag. Okay, so if every child gets one bag, we're gonna have 80, uh, which is the number of children that there are, equals to the number of bags. How many bags are there? There are C bags, okay? Now, for each bag, how many candy bars are in each bag? We're told that if each bag contains 18 candy bars, so to get the total number of candy that um, the entire party is going to have, you're going to take the number of bags times the number of candy in each bag. So let's say there's one bag, it'll be 18 candies, two bags, 36. So the number of bags times the num amount of candy in each bag will give you the total amount of candy that there's going to be in the party. Okay, so this equality guarantees that each child has a candy bag okay now what if at least each child must have at least one candy bag what does that mean it means that it cannot be anything less than one candy bag per child so um, at least another way for writing at least is it can it could be this is equivalent to um, that amount or greater, okay? It has to be that amount or greater. It cannot be less than that, okay? So this equality guarantees that each child has one bag, but could it be, could um, this quantity be less than 80? The answer is no. But this quantity could be greater, that's, that's perfectly fine, right? So this quantity has to be equal to or greater um, than eight. So to write this, this is an equality. To write as an inequality using at least, we're going to have the total amount of children have to be less than or equal to the total number of candy we have, which is the amount of bags times the amount of candy in each bag. All right. If the number of kids were more than this amount right here, guess what? Some kids will not have a candy bar. All right, so that won't work. So it could be more, that's fine. Or it could be equal, that's okay too, but it cannot be less than that, okay? So anytime you see at least, it could be that amount or greater, okay? That's this quantity right here. So let's uh, look at the different uh, variations that we have here. Um, using the reflexive property of inequality, we can rewrite this equation as uh, C times 18 can be written as 18C. Notice that the inequality is like uh, the alligator eating the bigger meal. So if I switch it around, the alligator has to keep eating the bigger meal, right? So and um, the inequality points to the smallest number and it eats the bigger meal, all right? So switching it, this inequality around is going to become 18C is greater than or equal to 80, okay? So number of bags has to be greater than or equal to the number of kids to guarantee that um, each child has at least one candy bar, all right? So our answer is clearly option number one. All right, let's take a look at that problem number four. It says, which statement regarding biased sampling is false, okay? So there are two things you want to keep in mind here, biased and sampling. Bias basically means that only a particular people are positioned to respond and sampling means that you're selecting some, uh, a, a selected amount of people from a sample space. So sampling doesn't mean you're selecting everything, just a few of them, that's what you're, you're selecting from your sample space, okay? All right, so let's see which one, which of the statements is false. The first one says online, online sampling is biased because only people who happen to visit the web, the website, will take the survey. So you do we, is that an accurate statement? The answer is yes, because only people who browse the web are going to be able to gain access to the online sampling, okay? So we can see the connection here, website, online. You have a bias, bias. There are people that visit the, they use the web, they're the only ones that are going to be able to gain access to this, to this, um, to this, us. Uh, survey. So this is this is a true statement. 
Let's look at the second one. A radio call in survey is biased because only people who feel strongly about the topic will respond. So we see in call in here and respond. Now, if you don't care about the topic, are you going to call in? The answer is no. But if you care about the topic, you will call in. So we can see the bias there that you're not randomly selecting anybody. It's only people that do care about the topic that are going to call in. So it's biased towards those who feel strongly about the topic. So this is true also. So this first one is true. The second one is true. Now let's look at the next one. A survey handed to every third person leaving the library is biased because everyone leaving the library was not asked to participate. Now we see um, library here. Now where is the bias? There is no bias here. The other item that's talking about is not everyone leaving the library. This is quantity right here. All right. So this is clearly false. It's false because when you're sampling, you do not need to survey every single person in your sample in in the um, in the group. You can just select a specific amount, just a sample. That's what the whole idea um, of sampling means. You just select a few elements from the set or a few people from the sample space and use that to form your conclusion. Okay, so um, this statement is false because there isn't any um, there isn't any direct connection here between the bias sampling and the whole idea of sampling itself. Okay, so it's biased because you, you're going only to the library, but it's false because the reason why it's biased is not because you're selecting everyone, it's because you're, you're going to the library, that's what makes it biased. Okay, now let's look at option four. It says asking for experts to take a survey is biased because they have particular knowledge of the topic. Do you see the bias there? Experts and knowledge of the topic. Is it connected? Absolutely. We can see the direction here. If you select only experts, the experts have the knowledge of the topic. Okay, so this statement is true. So you can clearly see that the, the bias sampling statement that's false is option number three. Okay, now let's move on to number five. It says which relation is not a function? So um, the definition of a function is a, is a rule that assigns every input to exactly one output. So the focus here is on the input. Every input has to be assigned to exactly one output. So remember that your inputs are your what? X or Y's. Your inputs are your X's. Okay? So um, whenever you're given um, a, a a relation in ordered pair notation, in set notation like this, you want to focus on your x's and ask yourself, is there any repetitions in the x's? So are there repetitions, repetitions in the x's, the x's or the inputs? Remember, every input has to be assigned to exactly one output. So you look at all the inputs and ask yourself, is there any repetition, okay? So let's go ahead and go through the uh, options that we have and um, take a look at uh, watch out for repetitions in the axes, okay? So for option one, we have two. Are there any other twos? No, one. Any other ones? No, negative one. No other repetitions, negative two. This is a function because every input was assigned to exactly one output. Okay, it doesn't matter that the output rep repeats, that doesn't matter. All you care about is the input. Okay, now let's look at the in option number two. We have two. Are there any other twos? No. Okay, that's good. One. Are there any other ones? Do the ones repeat? No, that's good. Zero. Any other zeros? No, that's good. Negative one. Any other negative ones? No, that's good. Negative two. Excellent. This is a relation. I'm, I'm sorry, the function. Okay, this relation is a function. Option three, inspect all the x's. We're looking for repetitions, okay? Keep that in mind. Twos, any other twos? No. One, any other ones? No. Zero, any other zeros? No. Negative one, any other negative one? No. Negative two by itself, excellent. That is a function. Now, this should be the answer, okay? By elimination, we should know that this is the answer. But let's just go through it again. Two, are there any other twos? Yes. So that automatically is a violation of the definition of a function. 
you have two being assigned to two distinct outputs. You have two going to two, and you have two going to negative two. So this is not a function, okay? Because you have one input going to two outputs. So this is an automatic fail right there. But let's see if there's another violation though. One, is there another net, is there another one? Yes. So this is double violation here. It violates the definition of a function twice. You know why? Because one is being assigned to one and the same input one is being assigned to another output negative one. And that's a violation of the definition of a function which involves assigning every input to exactly one output. So the bottom line is when you're determining if a relation or uh, if a relation is a function or not, just look for repetitions in the X's. The ones that have the X's repeating is normally the answer. Okay, so there goes your answer for what is not a function. And thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. Um, please feel free to subscribe to my channel so you can get updates to more clips such as this. Uh, more clips can be found on markcodeserve.com slash testprep. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.